Thanks for listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos and the PCC Multiverse. Check out more great podcasts today on one of these awesome affiliate networks. You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. The Tangibound Network. Check it out. Tangiboundnetwork.com. Listen to this show, the latest episode, every time. A proud member of the Gunna Geek Network. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all the other geeky podcasts over at GunnaGeekNetwork.com and get ready because geekiness begins in three, two, one. On this week's episode, Loki may be falling in love with Loki. Lord Miller seeks revenge on Star Wars. And what's the legacy of Independence Day 25 years later? All this and more as we reach our next stop, the PCC Multiverse. Don't be alarmed. The quasi-shimmering light before you is a trans-dimensional gateway to other worlds, other voices, other thoughts, and other realities. Up feels like down, and down feels like the number seven on a Wednesday morning. Don't worry. That quivering, blood-boiling sensation under your eyebrows is all a part of the charm. Welcome to the PCC Multiverse. And we're back with another episode of the PCC Multiverse. This is Gerald Glasser from Pop Culture Cosmos, Game Source, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and the Lakers Fast Break. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our shows. And if you can, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Plus, if you can like, share, subscribe, follow, or do anything that you can to support us right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos, it is sincerely appreciated. But it wouldn't be a PCC multiverse without my good friend. He is the Castle PCC on the Twitter and Instagram. You got to catch what he's doing today at Castle PCC with a K on Twitter and Instagram. It is my good friend indeed, who I wish for him, his wife, and absolutely everyone out there as well, whether you're celebrating or not, wherever you are around the world, a great weekend. And for us here in America, in the States, a happy July 4th weekend. It is my good friend. It is Marcus De La Garza. And Marcus, great to have you back once again in the torture chamber with me. Hey, this is a willing uh, attendance to the torture chamber. And I do really. You're not supposed to say that in public, my friend. You're supposed to say this is like one hour of pain for you. No, no, no. I always enjoy doing this. But you know what, Gerald? I also enjoy talking about NASCAR occasionally. And yes, something, that's how we originally met in the first place. It is. It is how we originally met. I came on to do a Daytona preview for you, I think. And we were going to have you on to do some sports things. And it never worked out. But the basis of our friendship is NASCAR. And there was big news yesterday. Pop Culture Cosmos hanger on. How about that? Yeah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> but yeah, Chip Ganassi ended up selling his team yesterday. Chip Ganassi Racing is being bought by Trackhouse Racing at the end of the year. It's uh, really big news because Trackhouse is a newer brand or a newer team with Justin Marks as their principal owner. They've got Pitbull on board as well. He's uh, also a partial owner in that team. And Miami, actually... Miami, Miami. Yeah, dude. I mean, f- the Fast and the Furious family is going to have to hop on board with this one eventually, I'd hope. But family, 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 uh, you know, that's all NASCAR. I can just see them, one of those Gen 7 cars right there tricking it out, oh, you know, yeah. coming out with mag wheels and things of that nature. <laughs> Not well, exactly sure. aerodynamic, but it would look really good. It looked great, but it would probably you know bring up the rear with all the uh, the lapped cars. So no, yes. but it's a, a re- really exciting time for uh, Trackhouse. You know they had a charter and then they lost their charter somewhere midpoint of this year. It ended up being sold to somebody else, and they were going to end up losing their their spot in the series. And they put too much money and effort in, and they ended up going out and buying a team. And sounds like they just backed the Brinks truck up, and Chip Ganassi is going to lap all the way to the bank. They did money talks, and Chip Ganassi walks. He's still got a lot of, in as far as IMSA and IndyCar, but it's so funny that his his eye was already out the door. I mean, he oh, yeah. had gone. We're talking about someone who had five cars in his stable at one time. He had five cars, five teams, five drivers in his stable at one time. Not too long ago, I think it was like two, three years ago that he had that many, and now he had he was down to two. 
yeah, it just like you said, money walks. Uh, money well, money and, talks, people walk. Well, and Kurt Bush's contract was up at the end of the year, so he was talking about walking somewhere else, which actually track house was p- potentially his destination. So looks like Ross Chastain might get the short end of the stick here when it comes to Chip Ganassi Racing being bought out by track house, but we'll see how it goes. It's, uh, if it's he's silly good season. enough, he'll find a job. I never That's worry true. about that in NASCAR. Silly season is upon us, though. It's one of our favorite times of the year, man. I'm that it is. Him. That it is indeed. But you go ahead if you want to shout out anything NASCAR, Castle PCC on the Twitter and Instagram. That's Marcus. He loves NASCAR. Go ahead and check him out today right there on social media with a K, of course. But we got a great episode we've got coming up for you. Hermanus Goel is going to be talking superheroes, the DC and Marvel universes coming up on the back end of the show. Plus, we're also going to be talking about the many saints of Newark, the Sopranos. Are they still relevant? Do people still care? We'll talk about the many saints of Newark, which is a Sopranos prequel coming up here on the episode. Lord and Miller. I know you know them as the guys behind the Lego movie, but Christopher Lord and Phil Miller, they're really, really prolific producers, not necessarily directors. They're still doing stuff out there in the directing realm, but as producers, this year alone, they've come out with two of the most high-profile animated movies to come to the streaming market. And I will have reviews of both of them and how they're a little bit of a shot at the Star Wars universe with good reason. That's coming up on the show as well. 25 years later, the July 4th holiday back in the mid-90s was all about Will Smith and Will Smith's Independence Day, which started it all in the craze of Every July 4th, us flocking at the theaters and going to see the latest Will Smith movie. We'll talk about the legacy of Independence Day and what this means to pop culture and the movie scene. We'll talk about that on the back end of the show. Black Widow's reviews started to come in, so we'll talk about that on the back end of the show as well. But first, my friend, before we get to Loki episode four, Kevin Feige said in recent interviews, I need to stand corrected here because I did not think that in the latest Shang-Chi trailer that they would put Wong, a.k.a. Benedict Wong, he says it actually is Wong in the Shang-Chi trailer, even though you didn't get a clear look at him being smacked upside his head by abomination in the trailer. Yeah. I mean, you see that. I don't know why he's actually involved with this. It, it's obviously not going to be a very large role for him. He's obviously going to be more prominent in Doctor Strange 2. Very interesting that they put him in there. I remember him or his character in the beginning of Infinity War not having enough money to buy a sandwich. So maybe they could use that premise that he still needs to get money to buy a sandwich. So maybe that's why he's in the ultimate fighting cage with Abomination after all. Yeah, I'm really interested to see how this storyline plays out here, dude. It's going to be fun to uh, watch how we kind of craft our our way through this entire thing. Because last time we saw Wong, he was fighting Thanos, wasn't he? Remember, he lined up with everybody at Avengers Endgame. Yeah, and remember, he says, do you want more? He's talking sarcastically to Doctor Strange as everybody's lining up. Yeah, I and mean, then there so, was a couple scenes of him protecting with the shield in the middle of the battle, and that was pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, I, I'm excited to see how we get from there to you know wherever we are here. Or, you know, it's 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 fun to watch how the Wong storyline has been interwoven into the MCU. That alone has been fun to watch. But yeah, man, I, I'm I'm pretty interested in this one. I think I was on board with you. I didn't think that was Wong, and I actually I probably made a little bit of an argument that it wasn't him to a few people. It, when I it doesn't look now. like it at first. I mean, it, it just looks yeah. like it, uh, just a standard character actor, whoever was just going to play a guardian of the inner sanctum or one of the inner sanctums, and just like you know, that's what yeah. it looked like. But Kevin Feige says it is. So if Kevin Feige says it is, it is Wong. I, so. I, I hope they're not scrambling over at Marvel Studios today because of (laughs) Kevin Feige putting his foot in his mouth or something. Like I was telling one of my daughters, who's a huge Marvel fan, I was telling her that I think it would be better suited to have just one split screen of Benedict Wong in that trailer. So you know it's him. So you can identify it's him. Not having to go ahead after the fact and say, oh yeah, by the way, it's him. 
I think it would have clarified a lot of things a lot more easily. And, and I just think it would have been better for, for all parties concerned. Plus it gains even more interest. Like, okay, why is Wong there? Well, we want to know why is a major character to the Dr. Strange universe in the middle of this? We're already curious to see why abomination is there from the Hulk universe. And we already identified Tim Roth is coming back to the she Hulk series. He's going to be signed up for that. And about, so I'm assuming Abomination will be there. Why is Abomination in the Shang-Chi trailer? So I'm asking the same questions on why that would be the case also as well for Benedict Wong's character. And I, it just, I don't mind at all. I think it's interesting. I just, just a split second on the frame. So you could clearly see it would be Benedict Wong would have yeah. helped so much more. Well, and I did see a, a, it was a freeze frame that somebody did. It might have been Variety. All you can see is the back of the head. Yeah. And it really, yeah, I mean, it. Uh, really what you're looking at in that shot is abomination. You're not looking at the back of the head and thinking, oh, that's Wong. Yeah, it would have garnered you so much more interest out there. Like, oh, ooh, why are these two famous characters that we're already familiar with, why are they yep. battling against each other? How did uh, they yeah, get to I that think- point? But yeah, I'm with you. It'd be nice to have some of these answers then. But I think we just got to wait and see what what happens here. Well, we'll see what happens. Again, it is Wong, a.k.a. Benedict Wong. He's going to be a part of the Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings movie. I'm just so excited about the movie already. I mean, we've already talked about it at numerous lengths on the show in regards to expanding the kung fu genre and expanding the kung fu mythos in cinema is just going to be so outstanding. And Never has it been more high profile, and I just wish this would have come out in 2019 where it would reap all the financial rewards that I think it deserves. But again, it is coming out later this year, and I'm looking forward to it. But now it even has more interesting things thrown in there with the ultimate fighting death match, cage match that you're seeing between Abomination and Wong. So this piques my interest even more and i know it's going to pique a lot of other interests anymore but you had to have read the articles you had to have heard what kevin feige said for the vast majority of the people who saw that trailer whether it was on public television or whether they just streamed it from youtube or what have you they don't know that it's one. yeah so they're going to yeah. get the surprise it just would have been more cool if, if it was more definitively known or shown that Wong was in there. That that's all. That's all I see. Yeah, no, I see what you mean, and it's. I think it'll be a nice surprise though. Just like you said, there's a lot of people that probably didn't uh, capture that fact when they watched on YouTube, or, or they won't they know it, and they won't yeah. know until they step into the theaters and they say, "Hey, that's the dude from Doctor Strange, man." Yep. So I, I it, it will be a nice shock for them. You know, I think you and I are, are the minority here. We live and die by the news here when it comes to pop culture. So I think I'm with you. There's a lot of people that are going to get a, a good shock when they show up at the theater and see Wong fighting Abomination. Absolutely. But what are your thoughts out there now that we officially do know, and I was stand corrected by Kevin Feige, the head of Marvel Studios, that it is Wong. He personally came out and corrected you, Gerald. I I, I remember that moment. That's was, fine. Yeah. You know what? If he can't, <laughs> absolutely. All the more power to him. Although I'd love to have an interview one-on-one, you know, so we could talk one-on-one because I've got a few questions I'd love to ask him. But be that as it may, he did confirm that it is Wong from Doctor Strange to the Multiverse of Madness coming up. He is going to be part of Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. He's going to be part of that movie. And in most unusual fashion, facing off against Abomination. Will this be the end of Wong? Not supposed to be, according to what I would thought was coming up for him in the future of Doctor Strange 2. I don't think it will be, but he looks like, from all appearances, he's going to get a little bit of a butt kicking at the hands of Abomination in Shang-Chi, The Legend of Ten Rings. Or does Wong have something up his sleeve as well? We'll find out coming up, but... You'll want to hear your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Does this get you even more excited for Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings? Let us know, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Thanks for checking out the PCC, you know, the Pop Culture Cosmos. We'll be back in one moment. I know you've been hearing about Manscaped on all those other programs and podcasts. Well, Manscaped and the Hoopheads Podcast Network are working together on something fantastic. And oh my goodness, have we got a deal for you. 
Manscaped.com has just released their wireless, waterproof, and rechargeable Lawnmower 4.0, which offers their trademark skin safe replaceable blades that gets you the ultra close shave exactly where you need it. Head on over to Manscaped.com and choose from the huge list of men's grooming and lifestyle products, including the ultra popular Lawnmower 4.0 Body Groomer, and get 20% off at Manscaped plus free shipping with the promo code FASTBREAK at manscaped.com. That's right, just type in FASTBREAK, all one word at checkout, at Manscaped, and get ready to start looking good this summer from your friends at Manscaped, the Hoop Heads Podcast Network, and the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. Well, my friend, there's still much more to talk about on today's program. Loki Episode 4 dropped this past week, and Disney Plus is... It's still thriving with this show, doing very well as far as rating-wise from what people can gather. The Nielsen ratings, which come out delayed several weeks behind, still showing that Loki has fared well. Obviously, I've said before on this show that Loki had the highest volume debut for any of the Marvel series, with aka Disney Plus, period. So it's done very well. Spoilers, we're going to go ahead and touch on that. It's led us into very unusual directions. Last week's show, I thought personally, was the best of the episodes so far. This episode, I thought, was okay as well. I didn't didn't mind it or not mind it. Got off to a little rocky start for me, though, because it shows the backstory of the Lady Loki and uh, Sylvie's original part in this whole thing with, with her becoming a variant and her creating a nexus when she's just playing with a, a ship toy, you know, an Asgardian ship toy yep. on Asgard. It doesn't really clarify really what that was all about. So I'm assuming you're going to get some clarification in the coming weeks. Hopefully they won't throw red herrings at us left and right like they did on WandaVision. But I want to hear your thoughts on this. It evolved into them escaping their certain doom off of a planet that was going to be destroyed, creating a nexus event and into a situation where they're taken back and thrust into custody in the TVA, leading ultimately to a face-off and spoilers. But it already throws off into a confrontation with the timekeepers, who you get to see the real, or is it the real, face of all three of them, one of them looking like the Lorax from Dr. Seuss. And I didn't get that at all, but... (laughs) You know, it just seemed to me that it was kind of very weird with the big old mustache. And I'm like, oh yeah. my gosh, you know. It's a Lorax. Yeah. yeah I didn't think of it in the moment, but as soon as you said it, it's yeah. a Lorax. It's yeah. a Lorax. <laughs> my, well, I actually told my daughter who was watching with me, and I said, that looks like something out of Dr. Seuss. And she's the one that's, dad, Lorax. And I was like, oh yeah, where's Danny DeVito when you need him? But <laughs> I want to ask you this, my friend. I mean, it's evolved into a situation where it led to combat with the TVA between Sylvie and Loki versus the TVA. And now you have a situation where seemingly by the end, if you watch the end credits, because there is a mid credit scene in there as well, that Loki has been transported after being stun gunned or whatever the uh, pulsed into that time period with the other Lokis that are there. So I want to hear your thoughts on this, my friend. It's it's taken a dramatic turn where we thought for a brief second that this could be the end of Loki because he got zapped, but he just got zapped to a different time frame. So where does it take us from here? You know, I'm really excited to see where we go from here. I, I can't tell you where we're going to go. I wish I had a little bit more detail you know, here about where the storyline's going, but I will agree with you. Watching last night, the Sylvie opening, the intro for the episode felt very clunky to me. It didn't feel like it jived very well with anything that kind of happened around it. Like you said, they are going to keep throwing things at us that may be red herrings and may, you know, actually apply to the storyline. Who knows? But yeah, dude, it, the whole meeting the timekeepers, fighting our way into the temple, you know, it, it kind of was wild to me. TBA to gets blown wide open. Everybody oh, yeah. seems to start finding out the secret that they're all variants working at the TBA. Which was interesting to me because, I mean, Mobius is the one that really questions, pushes back at first, and then jumps right into it. And I was really kind of shocked there. But, I mean, the whole Ravona erasing Mobius as he's pulling Loki out of that time prison time cell. Yeah, because Mobius finds out and realizes after doing his own investigating, not believing Loki 100%. What are the odds of that happening? 
he goes ahead and does his own investigation after and finds out that, yes, indeed, there is some funky stuff going on at the TVA and that they are all variants taken from different time frames and being reconditioned to go ahead and work for the TVA. Dude, I, I'm excited to see how the rest of the story un- unfolds for the rest of the season here. And I'm really hoping that they actually are keeping those streaming numbers up. You know, you did say that they had one of the biggest openings ever for the Disney Plus platform. I have appreciated what we've done with that show. It has kept you on your toes. I know the first episode was a little bit slow for you, but I do enjoy what we've done with it. I think they've been fun. I, it's kept you on your on your toes. You don't know where it's going. And I really didn't expect to see Loki foreshadowing his own death, you know, five minutes before that, when he said something along the lines of, you know, kill me. I've been killed plenty of times before and I always come yeah. back or something. So Yeah. And, and you know, he's not going to be dead, dead as soon as he got zapped by one of the time sticks. And it's so funny because they're fighting off against the TVA guards that whole time. And not until the end does somebody actually use the time stick for what you're actually supposed to use it for. They were always using the other end, like swords or like stabbing at each other. Like, it- why don't you just like, zap all each other? That's all you had to do. But instead, like, we're trying to play like everybody else is Dracula and stab him with the yeah, stake. You know? <laughs> exactly. So yeah. that was kind of, eh, you know, right there for you. But again, I'm still very curious of where this is going, and where this is headed. It may have transpired a little bit too quickly on the TBA. Everybody discovering that they're all variants. I think they maybe dropped it a little too soon. I think it would have been better as far as a, maybe another episode before it all pans itself out, but they need to go ahead. I understand the the, the allotment of time in, in this episode. I know that also I, I enjoyed certain aspects. The production design seems to be still top notch. You get to see Asgard in a different light uh, that for a brief second. Then you also see the planets and the, you know, they're sparing no expense as far as the special effects for a television series. And I'm really happy with it as far as from that point of view. They seem to be going ahead and saying, you know what, we are going to make this like an almost Marvel movie-ish type deal. And I really am liking the fact that they are not sparing the expenses on these shows. No, I mean, you're getting that full experience of a true Marvel movie, but it's in 45 minutes or 49 minute form. I don't think I understood that we only had six episodes of this in this first season and you know whether or not we get a second season, I guess remains to be seen because I don't. Well, think they have commissioned a writer to explore that possibility. Okay, good. Uh, so I mean, it'd be interesting to see if they can do it based on where they're taking the rest of the story here for the next two episodes. But July seventh is our next one. July fourteenth thereafter for episode six, the finale of the season. I'm going to be watching both of those. I'm going to be holding on for dear life because I have to imagine. We're just going to keep accelerating faster and faster from here. And it felt like we were really cooking along there at the end. One last thing I want to talk to you about, Loki, before we head into other stuff for the rest of the show. The fascinating love story between Loki. And himself. And himself. It's so funny to see. And I love the way Owen Wilson, you know, again, he's doing such a terrific job. And this is one of his best performances, I think, ever. I understand that some of it is atypical for a character in his allotment that, okay, he acts accordingly to the way that a lot of other individuals in that type of situation where they're part of something, then they find out it's not exactly what it is. And I understand that what he's doing is not groundbreaking, but to me, it's done so well. And his interplay with Tom Hiddleston is outstanding, but the way he calls it as far as, Loki developing feelings for Sylvie, a.k.a. Yep. the Lady Loki, and him calling him out on it is just truly hilarious. To me, it's some of his finest work since the Flying Tenenbaums. The, the Royal Tenenbaums, right? The, the Roy- yes, the Royal yeah. Tenenbaums. Yeah, to me, it's just one of his best performances since then. You know what's crazy is I was actually going to say the same thing. From the Royal Tenenbaums, you know, he's done some good things, but I would still mark that as one of his best performances ever. And I I really do love that movie. He's gotten caught in a loop where he's been cashing in on his voice through animated features, been cashing in on his comedic value through cheesy comedies for years. Do you have that range? Can you act? And Owen Wilson is proving to everyone out there that yes, he can act. I think he's done a really, (laughs) really good job. And to see him interplay with Tom Hiddleston and Dee Silvestro, the lady Loki, she's doing a tremendous job as well. 
interacting with Loki. So, I mean, this has really been a, a surprising thing for me to see how well from that standpoint. The story has and the writing hasn't always evened itself out on par with the acting, but the acting has just been truly top notch. You know, we talked about it a few weeks ago with the director that's on the series. There's a little bit of that British sci-fi and like kind of feel to it, the way it's oh, yeah. shot. The, yeah. And I felt like even though there were those moments. For episode it's very three, Terry Gilliam-ish. Yeah. But even though there's those moments for episode three and four, I don't know if my brain's just adapted to it or if I really thought it really worked really well for those episodes. But whatever it was, I think we're doing a great job with the way this has been shot and delivered to the audience. So I think it's your brain. No, no, I'm kidding. Yes, it's uh been very well done. I, I agree yeah. with you on that. Again, it has a very British sci-fi feel, and I'm loving it. Uh, I'm loving it right now, and kudos to the entire staff on that. Again, the writing has been up and down, but the acting has been top-notch. The production design has been top-notch, and I'm truly liking where we're going with Loki. What are your thoughts out there on Loki, episode four? Do you like where it's going? Were you surprised that Loki seemingly bit the dust at the end of the episode, but got a reprieve in the mid credit scene? Or did he? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Well, before we hit the break, my friend, I want to go ahead and hit you up on this real quick as we talk about Black Widow. Black Widow is coming next week. I am getting tickets for it. I'm going to go to the Thursday as early as I can. And I will probably provide a review next week. Ooh. Probably not with you because you will not have seen it by then. Or you will actually have to be up very late in order to record with me. So I don't think you want to do that. But you'll get to hear it on the PC Multiverse 232. So I will ask you, my friend, the reviews from other reviewers out there are coming in. They are higher than F9 which is encouraging, but then again, you don't see F9 for great reviews. You just go ahead and check out F9 for family, 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 and car crashing and all that. On an opening weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it is not getting the kind of reviews that Endgame or Infinity War got. It's still solid, right around the 70, according to Metacritic. Rotten Tomatoes has it as a, I think, a fresh, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so pretty solid reviews all the way around. I want to hear your thoughts. Does this give you kind of uh, you know a sense of relief that it's not being trashed all over the place, that you're ready to go out and check it out next week when it comes to theaters? Yeah, I would say that one of the big things that you and I have been worried about throughout has been every time we push this back, are we kind of just delaying the inevitable delivery of kind of just some subpar content and you know the early reviews that i read on rotten tomatoes they had a compilation of uh, a lot of the early reviews show that that's not going to be the case it seems like there's been a lot of people that have really enjoyed what they were able to do with this movie and the 70s spy vibe that they've created with it it's worked with everybody that's really seen the movie so far i think i'm with you i've, I've read a few things that said that you know this isn't going to be an end game this isn't going to be an infinity war level movie but it's definitely going to be better than anything, you know, with Doctor or Hulk or Thor in the name. And that, to me, means something. I mean, it, it, this is going to be something that's going to be top of the middle of the pack here when it comes to a Marvel franchise movie. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what they've done with this one. And, you know, this wait has been terrible. <laughs> we've talked about push timelines left and right, but I'm so glad that this is finally over and we finally get to watch this movie next week. My friend, since the start of the show almost five years ago, and actually heading back into the winning days of the Game Source podcast, okay, I've been asking for this movie. This should have been the first female superhero movie on the Marvel slate. This should have been ahead of Captain Marvel. With all due respect to Captain Marvel fans out there, I think this should have been something that came out during the Phase 1 or at the latest Phase 2 portion of the marvel slate and uh, you know I, I, am i going to feel that way coming next week we'll see but i know when this film should have come out and to see it come out now is still like a saving grace it's like okay this is great that's coming out now i really am supportive of it my daughter and i are really excited to go ahead and see it because i've been calling for this for so many years yeah, I mean, it would have been nice to have them release this when the hype for everything Marvel was as high as it was. 
leading up into Infinity War or maybe even Endgame, would have been nice to slide that in there and just have this movie. It just movie. seems like, in a little ways, it's like better late than never. It is. It is better late than never, but I, I think I'm with you. I think we would have hit the wave at the peak here and had you know Scarlett Johansson when she was really knocking that role out of the park, and she still is, don't get me wrong. It's just right when it, everybody was in the thick of things, I think yeah. this would have been a great movie to have uh, Right around the up. Winter Soldier. If this would have been the movie right after yeah, the Winter Soldier, that would have been perfect right there. Yes. All right. What are your thoughts out there on Black Widow? The reviews have started to trickle in, and they're somewhat positive. Want to hear your thoughts? If you're excited to go check out Black Widow coming up next week, share us your thoughts. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. Well, coming up after the break, we are going to be talking the many saints of Newark and the whole thing in regards to the Sopranos. We're going to be talking about Lord and Miller's revenge on Star Wars. And 25 years later, we're going to be talking about Independence Day and its legacy that it has left behind all this and Hemanish Goel talking superheroes, since that seems to be the theme for the day on this July 4th weekend. We're going to talk about all that coming up after the break. This is the PCC Multiverse. Video game box art, the stories behind the covers, in which we talk to the illustrators and artists who are responsible for gaming's most iconic images. Don't forget to check out Video Game Box Art, the stories behind the covers, celebrating gaming's most iconic images from the people who created them. This and many more from Rob McCallum Films. And we're back with the show. It's Gerald Glassford, along with my good friend, Mr. Castle PCC on the Twitter and Instagram. If you want to talk NASCAR, pop culture, what you're seeing on streaming, because he's a master of Netflix then you go ahead and reach out to him, Castle PCC with a K on Twitter and Instagram. But my friends, speaking of Netflix, we'll start with this first ahead of The Many Saints of Newark. And that is Lord and Miller. Uh, Lord and Miller, uh, you know, just a great team. They've done so many great things. They've become so notable since their directorial landmark in the Lego movie and how great that yep. was. And obviously... Lego Movie 2 and the Lego Batman and everything that they were a part of since then. And then they did such a great job with Into the Spider-Verse. And that was such a great animated hit. And of course, that earned Academy Awards as Best Animated Feature. And they've done such a great job with those things. Along the way, though, in between Into the Spider-Verse and the Lego Movie, they had a try at Star Wars. And we're working on the Star Wars project. I was it the solo movie or was I think it was, it was a, yeah, it was the solo movie, yeah. Yeah, it was a solo movie, and they were looking at making it more comedic, make, giving it a different tone. And I don't know if it's a quarter way through or halfway through, if memory serves, but they were kicked off the project by Disney due yep. to creative differences. And you saw what happened with Solo. I still think Solo is a solid film outside of the first terrible ten minutes of the film. <laughs> I still think it was. A, <laughs> I still think it was a solid film. It's like okay, yeah, the rest no, of the I film was like seven and a half. Okay, the film for me was seven and a half for uh, the rest of the movie, and a one for that first ten minutes. So I mean, outside of that, yeah. solo. If you can it, just turn off the first ten minutes, is a really decent film. So or turn it on and go get all your snacks and do everything you need to do in about ten minutes. And that's when you need to. Yeah, there you go. Down. But Donald Glover is amazing in the film. I'm just going to say that. He's, right yeah, out. he's outstanding. No, oh, but then I, he was really good too. I really enjoyed that. Yes, and Amelia Clark was okay. I thought she was okay. So, no, I I thought it was interesting. One of the in prepping for this story tonight, I was reading one of the articles on their experience on the Star Wars set, the Solo set, and it seems like neither one of them were ready to commit to being in the moment, being very serious. They were there to lighten things up and be a little more comedic. So I understand why they weren't being as serious and professional as maybe everybody else on the set around them, but obviously it didn't work out. Well, recently I got a chance to check out the Mitchell versus the machines. And then up after that, I said, I was going to watch America, the motion picture. I knew the Mitchell versus machines was Lord Miller as far as producing, but I didn't know America, the motion picture was, which was very surprising to me. And I, so I actually saw them back to back. And the first off is I know it's a little bit late, couple months out there but it is still one of the highest rated movies on netflix it is still one of the highest rated movies of the year 
Variety recently published their, so far, the best movies of 2021, and it is on that list. For me, it's the best movie I've seen this year. Mitchell's vs. the Machines is really, really... It's a story that is Pixar, yet Pixar didn't make it. And Thank you. When, when that trailer first came on and we were watching it, I looked at Jamie and I was like, this feels like Pixar, but not. It feels it like knockoff feel, Pixar right now is what it, it, it feels like Pixar. It has a different animation style. It has a lot of fourth wall breaking and it has a lot of nods to a lot of pop culture things, including Star Wars in there. And that's something that I want to talk about at the back end of this conversation. But yes, it is going to be one of the best movies this year. And it is already, for me, the best movie I've seen so far this year. I haven't gotten the chance to see many of the variety and some others are saying are the best movies this year, but I plan to, including yep. someone with that we interviewed, Liz Priestley, on the show. Her movie, Concrete Cowboy, is considered the best right now on variety. So kudos to her, Idris Elba, and everybody else involved with Concrete Cowboy. I do plan to check that out on Netflix. But yes, obviously some measure of revenge where they were able to go ahead and create a well-loving story that's a, a story of robots take over after an app goes wild and it talks a lot about technology taking over but also as well it, it has a great story between a father and a daughter that lets the tears run wild that is something that pixar does very well pixar yeah. always has that tear jerking part of it and definitely to me this was as good or better than any of the Pixar movies I've seen in the past couple of years. I think it narrowly beats Soul for me. It narrowly beats wow. Soul right now. I'm going to say that. That's a huge win for this movie. I'm looking yeah. forward to watching this then. Yeah, really, really a great movie. And I really uh, have high praise for it. But they also, like I said, I watched back to back right after that. <laughs> I can't believe you watch both of these back to back because yeah. they're the polar opposite kind of. <laughs> they are the polar opposite in the ways, but I mean, they both have their uh, over the top met things that go on. Yeah, they're both yeah. over the top, but America, the motion picture, I guess, recreates in their own fashion what they perceive how American history in 1776 was done, but it is nothing to be believed upon. It's just, it's over the top. It's crazy. It's out there. A lot of it's hit and miss. When okay. it hits, it really hits. And when it misses, it's like, eh, eh, we get the joke. Okay, move on. But it's a solid watch as well. Uh, and it does have a lot of movie references, including Titanic, including a lot of Star Wars. It does have some uh, really great vocal performances with Channing Tatum, it has Simon Pegg as King James in a role that's really funny as well. Killer Mike, he does a great job as well. All the voice actors, Olivia Munn's in there. She she does a great job. I mean, it is a really, really good mix. That's to me was the highlight was the voice acting because the voice acting was really helped propel this movie forward. The enthusiasm. Channing Tatum literally shouts at almost every scene. I cannot believe this guy just like <laughs> collapsed in exhaustion after doing this voiceover work because he literally shouts in almost every scene. To me, a lot of it is funny. You know, there is some of it that just is like, okay, we get the joke. We get the joke. It does have commentary on our lives today. The fact is it does it in such an over-the-top style with so many things that are just so wildly unbelievable, but yet are part of this revolutionary war quote unquote yeah <laughs> that it, yeah it, it's it's a lot of fun to watch in that sense so i give it a solid well, passing grade myself but it's not at the level of the mitchell versus machines but it's still a lot of fun to watch i will say i'm going to be torturing my best friend he's flying in from new york he's a history professor at west point and we're going to be watching this movie this weekend oh, he's going to be can't... tortured he's going to be absolutely <laughs> tortured <laughs> I can't wait for the first historical inaccuracy to come out of his mouth because he's going to get one and that's going to be like, hey, you got to turn your brain off and just watch. No, this there's 10,000 historical inaccuracies here. OK, when you have a 50 foot tall Paul Bunyan facing <laughs> off against uh, an animated Big Ben facing off against each other. OK, that tells you right there you need to turn your brain off and just enjoy it for what it is. It does have a social commentary. It does but, have a lot of things in there uh, that's trying to say and communicate. And it does have a lot of shots at Star Wars and other movies of, of its ilk. So, yes, it does do that. But, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun to watch. It's just a lot of fun to watch. Just to, just to hear the retorts back of uh, – I forget the actor who plays Benedict Arnold. He, he really works in the film. 
Andy Samberg is playing. Andy uh, Benedict. Samberg. Okay. Andy Samberg does a tremendous job as Benedict Arnold. Simon Pegg as King James in his limited role is really fun to deal with. And then, of course, Channing Tatum just shouting everywhere. is He plays George Washington as a goof, basically. Okay. Samuel Adams is played as a beer chugging frat guy. That's Jason Manzukas too, and yeah. he's all over the place right now. He's yeah, doing House Broken on Fox. He did this. I mean, yeah. That, and again, it tells a lot of social commentary, but it does it in such a fun take. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. it, it it's a nice turn off your brain popcorn watch. The point is, what I'm trying to make, and I'll wrap this up, is that Christopher Lord and Phil Miller have done a great job post Star Wars because getting dumped by Star Wars could have been a defining moment in their career as far as failure is concerned and them just being written off the map by Hollywood entirely. But not only have they exceeded expectations or done really well since then, they've just gone well overboard. And the fantastic job that they did in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse and how well that was perceived, not only doing well financially, critically, but winning an Academy Award, but moving that into other projects that they've been a part of. And again, I was not doing intentionally a Lord Miller back-to-back, but I ended up watching a pretty good Lord Miller back-to-back. That's quite the back-to-back movie situation there. And I'm, I'm kind of shocked you were able to do that. I kind of want to try and see if I can recreate it just because of how crazy that's got to be to go from children's movie to America, the motion picture. It's not a children's movie. It's a okay, yeah, uh, it's a Mitchell, family movie. The Mitchell right? versus yeah. the Machines is a family movie, but it's yep. remember it's based off of an apocalyptic situation where the machines take over and imprison everybody on the planet except for the Mitchells. So you got to put right. that into okay. context. All right, so. all right. A little bit of a family movie. If you've got some kids that are in that like eight to fourteen range, it'd be great, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. But it also showcases the the love that's there and how father and daughters grow apart but yet can reconcile and get back together. And that's, that's touching. It's heartwarming. And in the middle of all this chaos, everybody in the family can play a part in something successful. And everybody in the family plays a part in something this successful as saving the world in the Mitchell machine. So I do highly recommend it. In fact, I recommend both. Uh, And I thought that both were fun, Uh, but Marcus, uh, tell me what's your thoughts on both of them. But I hear also want to hear everybody else. Pop culture cosmos yeah. at yahoo.com, the Mitchell versus the machines and America, the motion picture. See both back to back. I know they're both right now on Netflix. They're right there for you. Just go ahead and check it out. Both are really well worth watching and a lot of fun. Gerald, I am going to be live tweeting Kevin's outrage as we watch America, the motion picture, just because I have to imagine it's going to be outstanding. And those little quips are going to be great. And could make some great content for us. So I look forward to seeing what our listeners have to say about the live tweeting. He will not be your best friend after (laughs) watching that movie. Especially if that's his role as a history professor. It it, is, yeah. It takes your history book. It takes even an updated. It takes a fully correct history book on that period of time in a revolutionary war and throws out the window. Yes. When George (laughs) Washington's best friend is Abe Lincoln, (laughs) that tells it all. But I want to hear your thoughts out there on the Mitchell versus Machines and also as well, America the Motion Picture. Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Well, coming up next, it is Hamanish Goel. He's going to stop by to talk a little bit about superheroes and his thoughts on the superhero genre, talking a little bit about Marvel, talking about DC. He's going to be talking about both those things. And then afterwards, I will be dropping some opinions on the revival of the Sopranos franchise in the many states of Newark, and then also as well, we reminisce on 25 years after Independence Day, even though it will be Independence Day coming up. I'm talking about the movie, of course, but we'll talk about the (laughs) legacy that it has coming up after the break. This is the PCC Multiverse. If you need your video game fix, be sure to check out Retro City Games. Located in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada, Retro City Games has the cure for all your video game vices. Retro games and games for current consoles, Nintendo, Sega, PlayStation, Xbox, and more. Retro City Games has all the staples from any library and some highly collectible offerings too. So pick up a few games today at Retro City Games in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada. Retro City Games is your video game metropolis. 
talk these days are always about superheroes, whether it's the DC, whether it's the Marvel, whether it's the boys, whether it's so many of the other different superhero series that are out there, whether it's on regular commercial TV, whether it's on cable TV, whether it's on streaming or movies, a lot of people are talking about what's going on in the world of superheroes. And here today, because he asked to go ahead and talk about what's going on with the superhero genre is a good man indeed. He is an outstanding student at VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University. It is Hamanish Goel. And Hamanish, thank you for coming on the program today. It's a pleasure being here, Gerald. I know you said you have a background and a great interest in following the media, becoming a media analyst, media reviewer, possibly even looking into becoming a film reviewer and all that. I mean, critic culture, it's a little bit different now than in the past years, as been noted on our show, as far as the influence. But there still are a lot of critics out there who do have a lot of sway with fans out there. So I know a lot of people are talking about the future for what's coming up with the DC Universe and also as well the Marvel Universe. Which attracts to you more? Which are you more compelled to follow? It's always a good thing to see because in the past it was like Pepsi or Coke, DC or Marvel. Now these days, it seems like a lot of people are transitioning to both. But is there one that appeals to you more? In terms of the one that appeals to me the most, I, I would have to go with Marvel. One, because of like the story content that they deliver and just how they take a plot and they try to show these end credit scenes at the end of the movie, which keep people anticipated to see what happens in that scenario, you know, where is it leading to, you know, like this whole Infinity Saga was about the Infinity Stones, just every step, any clues you would get within the film, outside of the film, was like one step ahead. It kept the momentum going, it kept the audience engaged. That it certainly did, but as we've seen, or if you had a chance to see Loki so far on Disney+, Plus. The Infinity Stones are rather useless in this next phase of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which they're now going into a time-shifting multiverse concept, which we'll be seeing play out over the next few years. We're seeing this, whether it's you know, basically right now in Disney Plus with WandaVision. We saw it earlier this year, a little taste of it. We're obviously seeing it now with Loki, where he's hopping in and out of time variances. We're also talking about what's coming up with Doctor Strange 2, what's coming up with the Eternals, and so many others that are coming up in the not-too-distant future that will deal with Spider-Man, of course. Spider-Man No Way Home, that will deal with a multiverse concept in and of itself, and that's something that's adjacent to the regular Marvel Cinematic Universe because it's Sony that's in charge of dealing with this, obviously with a heavy hand from Marvel as well. But I want to hear your thoughts as we go forward on this. Are you excited as ever to be a Marvel fan for what's coming up in their universe? Yeah, I mean, from when they ended at, because obviously a lot of the answers got revealed in um, Endgame and Infinity War, just where was the storyline going at? And I mean, today, I mean, those are the two films that arguably are one of the best, but from, I think it was far from home Spider-Man when the phase three ended. From there, we got a good taste as to, you know, they, you know, they got Thanos, the world is fine, Iron Man eventually because of the power of the Infinity Stones died, Captain America went back in time. And so we're here where cut too short, the pandemic, and now in the WandaVisions era where you're, you're getting a good sense of Wanda understanding her powers and even at the end credit scene where she hears her kid's voice it was billy and tommy Bill, yeah billy and tommy and wicked and speed in the comics and i'm guessing from the scene where wanda was i think from there is where the doctor strange is gonna kind of get its way into so it just it's starting to pick up into like where you can see the scenes you know, kind of intertwine each other or like connect, you know, even like the Falcon, the Winter Soldier, which didn't have a lot of Infinity Stones, but it showed the sense of what was going on in the minds of the Winter Soldier, Falcon, after what happened to Captain America. And yes, I am excited for the next phase. 
But once again, I'm talking to Hamanish Goel. He's got a lot of stuff that he puts out there on social media. So if you go ahead and check him out, Hamanish Goel. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on this. Try to figure out DC for a second here because they've got these successful projects and not so successful projects over the past five, six years that they've gone ahead and created, some with success, some with not. And like I said before, if you go ahead and put it up on a whiteboard on DC, it's got a lot of race marks. It's got a lot of scratch outs. It's got a lot of things that work that they want to expand upon, but don't really connect to anything else. Tell me about your thoughts on DC. I mean, there are several films that resonate with the audience. I feel like they've done a really good job with like the solo films, whether it be like a Wonder Woman or an Aquaman or the Man of Steel. I mean, I know the Christopher Nolan Dark Knight trilogy doesn't really go with the DC Cinematic Universe, but just it's kind of pertained to the Batman character. So those solo films have definitely been successful for them. When it came to Justice League, now we know what the vision is through HBO Max, the Zack Snyder's Justice League. In DC, it was more of like, yeah, that looks like a cool topic, but it wasn't something where people were watching the next film or looking forward to it because there was like a timeline going. There was no like, it wasn't capturing the uh, audience's attention. It, it would vary from film to film. So I, feel, I felt like with the amount of Batman and Superman films that they've done, it kind of felt like that they were just staying around that genre and not kind of getting out of that zone. So they kind of missed around creating that story and looking at other characters within the DC universe. Like, I mean, after that, they explored the Suicide Squad. I mean, the Batman versus Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Shazam, like the Birds of Prey. You know, now they've started branching out and even their future projects, like The Flash was a project that was supposed to happen way back. And now it's in the works. So it's definitely good to see that they're focusing on the solar films now. But in terms of looking forward to DC, just like entertainment was, I would have to say is like the Suicide Squad, the new one from James Gunn. It's going to be interesting to see. Once again, I'm speaking to Hermanish Goel from VCU. Check out Hermanish Goel on LinkedIn and also Reddit as well. He's an aspiring film critic that's in the making loves to go ahead and talk about entertainment and pop culture he was a great part of our e3 coverage cannot thank him enough for taking the time to speak in regards to that panel it was awesome having him there but even more so today talking about superhero culture and also as well i'm looking forward to have you coming back on to talk pop culture right here at the pcc multiverse you're listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos. And we're back to close out the show. This is the PCC Multiverse. I'm here with my good friend, Mr. Marcus De La Garza. Want to thank so much, Himanish Goel, for stopping by on the program. HBO Max just dropped a trailer for The Many Saints of Newark, which is a Sopranos prequel, which includes James Gandolfini's son. There's so much of a time gap now since the end of The Sopranos when they were leaving that diner and the anticlimactic way that the series ended in a lot of people's yep. minds to many years later to seeing a prequel now. Are people ready and willing to get into The Sopranos again? I mean, is this something you're interested in doing, checking this movie out? In today's world, I think I would have probably done a series personally for this. I mean, when you're making that project, you can't go ahead and backtrack and say, oh, maybe this would have worked better as a six episode series. Because even in 2019, you weren't sure of the whole streaming platform and how successful short it was about series to become. Like, Yeah, <laughs> where it was about to become. So obviously you couldn't foresee that. Well, I know Josh cannot stand going back in time and doing prequels. He, he's not in favor of that ever. So I want to hear your thoughts if you're in the same frame of mind or different than he is. So typically I agree with Josh when it comes to prequels. Once we've set the first movie in motion. They're just cash I, grabs. They, they are. They're just cash grabs and it, it offers nothing. I'd rather you just give me a sequel at this point. But I do think that there's some merit in this one. You know, as we were watching the trailer, Jamie did say, oh my gosh, this might be the thing that makes me go back to watch The Sopranos. Like, this looks great. So, I mean, if that could make that kind of an impression on her and she's really feeling like, hey, I think I should go back and watch this. I think we've had enough time pass and I don't think it's been too much time that's passed since the end of The Sopranos. People are still hungry for it just because of I've had a lot of friends reach out to me and say, have you seen the trailer for this one? <laughs> and so uh, maybe it's just my my demographic, my age group here. But for me, I, I don't think this is a mess. This is fun. And 
you know, with the names that were attached to it, I can see why they didn't want to do a series. They can line it up as one go and let's get a nice two hour long movie out of it. It looks like so far the many saints of Newark looking like it's going to be a, a decent hit for HBO max. And also when it comes to theaters later this year. So definitely looking forward to that. But my friend, before we head on out, wanted to go ahead and wish everyone again a tremendous 4th of July weekend. And if you're not celebrating it around the world where you hear us, want to wish you a fantastic weekend as well. Please be safe. I know there's stuff still going on out there. So please just go ahead and be as safe as you can and enjoy it so much with your family if possible. But before we head on out, my friend, July 4th in America, obviously for reasons, it's a big part of our country, a big part of our heritage. But from pop culture standpoint, during the mid-90s, there was a period of time when July 4th was the preeminent time of the year for movies. It was May before Marvel made it May. You know, you know what I'm saying is yeah, Marvel yeah. made May, that first week of May, really cemented it as the first and most important weekend of the year. But before that, with it was Will 4th Smith, of July weekend. Yeah. it was 4th of July weekend, Will Smith with Independence Day, then afterwards he did Men in Black. It solidified that as a cornerstone. It still is a cornerstone of the movie industry in normal times. Let's just preface that right now. It's a different story. But in normal times, the July 4th industry, you know, as far as from a box office standpoint, would be very, very profitable for them. But in the 90s, it was July 4th as the preeminent time and independence day with its special effects which were so cutting edge at the time everybody remembers the scene where the aliens are blowing up the geffen building in la and then they were blowing up the white house everybody remembers that at that time it seemed so dramatic and seemed so impactful and everybody's just going wow the special effects now you can see a lot when you watch in the cable television now or streaming it it's aged and it hasn't aged no. well and it's a quirky story, and it's over the top, and it's cheesy, and it's not as impactful as it once was, but it's still a legacy that it has. So I want to hear your thoughts on Independence Day when you watched it at the time and the market is left behind for the movie industry. Yeah, I mean, I do want to say nostalgia is a hell of a drug. I do look back fondly upon Independence Day. I feel like there were people everywhere chasing that same energy that Independence Day had for years. And it took until Marvel really totally reformed the summer release schedule. And it's kind of weird. I I hadn't thought of it like that uh, until you just brought that up, Gerald, was that, you know, we really shifted away from that 4th of July release. Everything's May now. You could have a billion dollar movie at any point given time of the year. I mean, there were movies that were scoring well that were debuting in February, uh, I think only January has there not really been one huge one. There's been obviously box office winners that come out in January, but January is still kind of known as the dumping ground for movies that the box office doesn't really want to go ahead and support. But for the most part, you know, you can have a movie coming out in in February, March, April. You can even have it coming in September and October and still reap, reap the benefits of it. But July 4th was the original point in the time where the, the box office was just so huge. And now that May has taken over, it doesn't have quite the impact and probably will not have quite the impact going forward. But that doesn't mean you still can't have a 100 or $200 million blockbuster during July 4th weekend. If people really want to question what this movie did for the industry, you kind of look around and you see 25 years later, Budweiser is doing a commercial with Bill Pullman where he reprises his famous speech from the movie and does something fun with it for them. That kind of speaks the volume of what kind of an impact that movie had had. Really interesting to me to see that, you know, people are still on board with this one as hard as as I am. And I understand that sometimes I get weird about certain movies, but I love this movie and looking forward to watching it this weekend. But you want to hear your thoughts on Independence Day and the legacy it has left behind. Pop Culture Cosmos at Yahoo.com. But my friend, we've come to a close on another great episode of the PCC Multiverse. Thank you so much for joining me as always. But any last thoughts on the way out? Yeah, two quick things. Anybody that feels bad that we're going to make Kevin watch America the Motion Picture, he makes us watch B and C level horror movies anytime he's around. So uh, this is just payback for all the times I've watched really, really, really bad horror movies. It's the purge, the forever purge. I know it's not Brad Pitt, but it's where he sounds like Brad Pitt. It kind of does. And then second thing was Chicken Sandwich Wars, man. They're back at it. 
Shake Shack has the hot honey chicken sandwich. Yeah, I mean, maybe uh, I might take a trip down and go pick one up this weekend. I did the pop I want for social media. You got to go ahead and bite the bullet right on this one. You bite the bullet. I'm going to bite the chicken sandwich. What are you talking about, baby? <laughs> this is going to be right. a great. But, you know, as always, I'll see you next week, dude. Absolutely. Looking forward to it as well, my friend. On Monday's show with Josh Peterson, we're going to go ahead and talk about what went on at the box office with, of course, F9 and the second week. We've got also as well the Boss Baby. And Universal is doing the trifecta with the Forever Purge. The cast <laughs> coming out this weekend, so we'll check out at the box office, see how well it's doing over the holiday weekend. Plus, also, we're going to be talking the Tomorrow War. And will this $200 million Amazon gamble pay off? We'll talk about that coming up on the Monday show as well. So for Marcus De La Garza, this is Gerald Glass. It's another beautiful day in paradise right here in the PCC Multiverse. We thank you for listening. And here's hoping you have yourself a great day. Yeah. Welcome to Dr. Geek's Laboratory. Hello everyone, Dr. Geek here with a shout out to all the scientists who worked tirelessly to bring a COVID-19 vaccine into reality. <laughs> Let's face it, creating something of this magnitude is a miracle worthy of Dr. McCoy himself. And now, Dr. Geek needs you to do your part. Remember, each shot is one small step back to normal, one giant leap to putting the pandemic behind us. We can do this. For more information, visit vaccines.gov to find your nearest provider. Okay, promo for the Flopcast. Let's go. First, I need an adjective. Uh, naked. You need a noun. Wombat. Place. Woonsocket, Rhode Island. Number. Uh, 251. Okay then, the Flopcast is a naked podcast about cartoons, music, comics, movies, and wombats. Find us on the ESO Network and Flopcast.net. Go ahead and listen to it in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. <laughs> 251 times. <laughs> You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Tangent Bound Network. Let your voice be heard. TangentBoundNetwork.com Thanks so much for downloading the Pop Culture Cosmos and stay tuned as more great podcasts are on the way. Thanks again for listening to us here at the Pop Culture Cosmos.